Hello, everybody. How is everyone's Thursdays going? I've just had a lovely evening because we've just done our first late night shopping with a book nook. So we had mulled wine and mince pies and yes, perfect. It was a great evening. Um, so I'm sure you're all here for the main event. So we've got Rachel Joyce on with us this evening. Um, many of you I'm sure have heard of her before. She's a best-selling author. Um, she's written radio plays. Um, she's got a recent book out this year. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rachel and she's going to kick us off with a little introduction to her latest book, which is Miss Benson's Beetle. It's this one here. You might have seen it in the bookshop. It's a beautiful cover. Um, and she's going to give us a little teaser. Um, and then we're going to move on to some Q&A. So if you've got any questions, um, you can start putting them in the comment box. And then we can ask Rachel as we go along. So I'll hand over to Rachel. Hello, everyone. Oh, uh, yes, this is, well, this is, um, this is my home, obviously. And in the background, there is one of my dogs. Uh, who's not supposed to be in the room, but obviously has snuck in. So uh, I'm here to introduce you to my new book, um, which Shannon just showed you, but here it is again, um, Miss Benson's Beetle. It's the only book of mine that actually glitters as you move it. And it's uh, set in 1950, and it's the story of Marjorie Benson, of the title, who is a, a school teacher in her late 40s, who's led a pretty sheltered life, uh, a pretty tough life and a very hidden life, I would say. But her passion since she was a child has been to find uh, a golden beetle that may or may not exist on the other side of the world on an island called New Caledonia, which is real. Um, the only thing she needs, this being 1950, is an assistant. Uh, but of course, the woman that she ends up with going on this trip with is the last woman on the planet that you would actually want to be with. Marjorie is very set in her ways. She's very introverted. Um, she's quite stubborn, I would say. She has, a, But she has a very particular way of approaching life, whereas Enid Pretty, in her bright pink traveling suit and her, with her bright yellow hair and her kind of chaotic way of constantly talking, is just the complete opposite. And so this is a story that is... Uh, it's essentially an adventure story for women, unashamedly an adventure story for women. Uh, but it's also uh, an exploration of the most spectacular female friendship. Uh, so I thought that I would just begin um, today by reading you uh, a passage. In fact, the opening, some of the opening. Um, because then, you know, there are no spoilers and I'm not hiding anything from you and you know as much as everybody else if you haven't managed to read it. And I'm sure not many people have yet. So the first chapter is called The Golden Beetle of New Caledonia, 1914. And you'll just have to ignore my dog. When Marjorie was 10, she fell in love with a beetle. It was a bright summer's day and all the windows of the rectory were open. She had an idea about sailing her wooden animals across the floor two by two, but the set had belonged to her brothers once, and most of them were either coloured in or broken. Some were even missing altogether. She was wondering if, in the circumstances, you could pair a three-legged camel and a bird with spots when her father came out of his study. Do you have a moment, old girl, he said. There's something I want to show you. So she put down the camel and the bird, and she followed him. She would have stood on her head if he'd asked. Her father went to his desk. He sat there, nodding and smiling. She could tell he didn't have a proper reason for calling her. He just wanted her to be with him for a while. Since her four brothers had left for war, he often called her. Or she'd find him loitering at the foot of the stairs, searching for something without seeming to know what it was. His eyes were the kindest in the world, and the bald top of his head gave him a naked look like an egg. I think I have something that might interest you, old girl, he said. Nothing much, but maybe you will like it. At this point, he would normally produce something he'd found in the garden, but instead he opened a book called Incredible Creatures. It looked important, like the Bible or an encyclopedia, and there was a general smell of old things, but that could well have been him. 
Marjorie stood at his side, trying hard not to fidget. The first page was a painted illustration of a man. He had a normal face and normal arms, but where his legs should have been, a green mermaid tail. She was amazed. The next picture was just as strange, a squirrel like one in the garden, but this had wings. And it went on, page after page, one incredible creature after another. Well, well, look, her father kept saying. Well, now, goodness me, look at this chap, Marjorie. Are they real? They might be. Are they in a zoo? Oh, no, dear heart. If these creatures live, they've not been found. There are people who believe they exist, but they haven't caught them yet, so they can't prove it. She had no idea what he was talking about. Until that moment, she'd assumed everything in the world was already found. It had never occurred to her things might happen in reverse, that you could see a picture of something in a book, that you could, as good as imagine it, and then go off and look. Her father showed her the Himalayan Yeti, the Loch Ness Monster, the Patagonian giant sloth. There was the Irish elk with antlers as big as wings, the South African quagga, which started as a zebra until it ran out of stripes and became a horse the great orc, the lion-tailed monkey, the Queensland tiger. So many incredible extra creatures in the world and nobody had found a single one of them. Do you think they're real? She said. Her father nodded. I have begun to feel comforted, he said, by the thought of all we do not know, which is nearly everything. With this upside down piece of wisdom, he turned another page. Ah, he pointed at a speck. A beetle. Well, how nothing this was, how small and ordinary. She couldn't see what it was doing in a book of incredible creatures, never mind whether it was not yet found. It was the sort of thing she would tread on and not notice. He told her the head of a beetle was called the head, the middle was the thorax, and the bottom half was the abdomen. Beetles had two pairs of wings. Did she know that? One delicate set that did the actual flying and another hardened pair to protect the first. There were more kinds of beetle on God's earth than any other species and they were each unique in remarkable ways. It looks a bit plain, she said. Marjorie had heard her aunts call her plain, not her brothers though. They were handsome as horses. Ah, but look. He turned to the next page and her insides gave a lurch. Here the beetle was again, magnified about 20 times, and she had been wrong. She had been so wrong she could hardly believe her eyes. Close up, that small plain thing was not plain, not one bit. Oval in shape and gold all over. It was incandescent. Gold head, gold thorax, gold abdomen. Even its tiny legs were gold as if nature had taken a bit of jewellery and made an insect instead. It was infinitely more glorious than a man with a tail. The golden beetle of New Caledonia, said her father. Imagine how it would be to find this one and bring it home. I've just been completely upstaged by the dog. Amazing. No, not at all. Not at all. And I do like the little like jingle at the end. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of fussing going on in the background there. <laughs> Maybe it's a bit of jealousy, not paying attention <laughs> to him. Was it a girl or boy? Uh, a girl. Oh, lovely. I don't know. I think it added to the effect. I think you've got a very cosy vibe going on there. Um, <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that reading and introduction to the book. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just fascinated sort of where the ideas came from. Um, and like I say to everyone, if you've got any questions, you know, start firing away in the comments um, and I'll sort of just ask some of mine in the meantime. Um, but yeah, so you, you kind of gave an overview at the start. So um, the main bit of the book we say is like in 1950s England, kind yeah. of post-war England, it's set, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, and it's like you say, it's this kind of story of like an unlikely friendship. Um, but to start off with, it's you were sort of saying about the fascination with like the beetle. So what made you choose sort of that idea or the beetle? I guess it's quite like like an insignificant animal, I suppose. But um, yeah, yeah, where did that inspiration come from? 
Well, it came, I mean, it, the book came from a number of places because I think for me, a book always starts, it's like having on your oven about, you know, six different pots. And I've normally got about six different pots kind of going on with each book. But one of the ideas was um, years and years ago, I mean, really a long, long time ago, I heard a piece on the radio about cryptozoology, which I'd never heard of. And I was fascinated. So cryptozoology, for those who don't know, like me, uh, is the science, though scientists don't recognize it, the science of uh, discovering animals whose existence has not yet been proved. So kind of far out there example is the Loch Ness Monster, creatures that some people believe exist and there might be a mythical reason for believing in them or they might be somewhere in literature, but they haven't yet been proved to exist. Uh, and I thought this was such a kind of, fascinating, brilliant, mad idea that I kind of really began to think about what it would take to find an animal that hasn't been found. And I thought, well, it's going to take so much research. It's going to take, uh, you know, really knowing, really knowing your subject, but it's going to take faith and it's going to take obstinacy. And I thought those are all really interesting to me. So I didn't really want to write about the Loch Ness Monster, but I thought I do, I wouldn't mind writing about a beetle, something that's so tiny, you could tread on it, but actually so beautiful. Uh, and also I knew nothing about beetles, which again, for me as a writer is always a good place to start because you know that you're gonna go on a big journey of learning yourself. So I just then found out everything I could about beetles. I went on a real beetle trip. And yeah. it was great. That's what I, because that's what I was sort of going to ask you, I guess, was like, did you ever have any sort of like affinity with beetles? But that was just as educational for you as it was for like your characters in the book. Yeah. 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 Um, we've had a really lovely comment. Um, so let me just scroll back and find it. So uh, Christiana um says she loves the opening to your book and do you have any advice on how to write a great opening for a novel oh i wish i knew the answer because that i'd be i'd be fine um but um i think the opening is the most important it's the most important part of the book it's where it's like it's like the door through which you're going to take your reader into your whole world. And you can put your door absolutely anywhere. So finding how to kind of, how to introduce your reader to this, to the world of your book, to the tone of your book uh, is, is really, really essential. And I think you really have to think about it and you maybe have to try lots of different ways of doing it. I know some people who say you can't possibly write the opening until you've read the whole book, though I don't believe that. I spend ages writing the beginning, trying to find the right way in, um, because I feel it's so important. Because, you know, it's so easy just to pick up a book and go, oh, no, no. And for me, the opening is like a, um, it's like a spell. You know, it's how am I going to entice the reader to come with me? And you've, I think from the first sentence, you have to intrigue and delight and interest. Yeah. And I think, like you say, it really sets a tone because already you've set the tone of kind of adventure and like mystery. Um, yeah. And yeah. I think already as a reader, you're sort of like, oh, I want to know, do they find this beetle? Do they go on to, you know, do all that? Um, yeah. And I know that this probably isn't right at the start of your opening because you've obviously not done the whole thing but we learn quite early on as well don't we there's been quite a lot of tragedy tra tragedy sorry um yes. so that kind of grips you a bit as well doesn't it so do you is there anything you can kind of give us a clue about other elements that might run through the book because obviously it's post-war isn't it is when it's set um yes. yes so i set it post-war because um well i were well, a number of reasons i, I I, I basically, as I was said in my introduction, wanted to write an adventure story for women. That was what I set out to do. So in order to do that, I, I really looked at the genre, the kind of male adventure story genre and, and all the films, you know, and basically, I mean, you know, not always, but mainly it's men. And mainly, and there's often a dog <laughs> and they're being pursued. So I just was thinking, like, how can I use this genre for my women? How can I subvert it and take it into my style of doing things, my take on the world, but basically use that 
you know, genre and celebrate women. That was what I really wanted to do. So, uh, yes, I did. I did a lot of research in that in that kind of area, too. Um, but that was very definitely one of the kind of central impulses of the book. I'm not sure that I answered your question. Oh. I maybe got a bit lost there. Yeah, no, I just asked you what were your general, because like, I don't want to give too much away, but there's quite a lot of things in there. You've got like the adventure. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really like how you focus on friendship as well, because um, I think people write often about like romantic relationships, but yours is on like a lot on female friendship and especially yeah. like, an unlikely female yeah. friendship, isn't it? Um, so yes. Where kind of did the inspiration come from for that sort of romantic, not sorry, yeah. unromantic yeah. relationship? Yeah, I mean, I knew very definitely that that it actually came about originally when I was writing my last book, The Music Shop. Um, uh, and I just began to think, I think I just began to think, hang on, why am I writing? Why am I not writing simply for women? What, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. uh, why am I not putting women at the heart of, I mean, I always have women in my fiction. I've never not had, and I think the women that I've written, I always believe in and are very, that they kind of, the driving forces of the plot, but I haven't put the women right at the centre. There's often been, you know, a man who's the and I just thought, what am I? I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm a woman, uh, so I just thought, right, okay, I'm writing a book with no men. That I started off thinking just just women, and also I wanted to see, I wanted to kind of capture what happens between women when men aren't there. And when they're not, you know, when it's not about, because often, even if you do put women at the centre of the book, actually, a lot of the book would be about their their marriages or their, you know, whatever their relationships. But I, I, I want the women with no relationships mm -hmm. apart from one another. They are, they are, you know, husband and wife, sisters, they are everything to one another. Uh, so it was intended to be no men. And then uh, I had one man, uh, oh, sorry, who was supposed to just come into the book at the point that Marjorie was looking for an assistant uh, to go with her on this amazing trip. And all he had to do was be wrong for the job and then leave. That was all that was required <laughs> for the character. And I just, because I do, I mean, I think people often think that you just write it once and then that's it. And I don't, I go, I go over and over and over just looking for a kind of better word or a better structure or a better rhythm. It's so kind of organic. But anyway, his bit just kept getting longer. It was just supposed to be, you know, he's a bit part. It was, it was just a paragraph. And I kind of, it dawned on me one day, I thought he cannot believe that this book isn't about him. So I thought, well, that's quite interesting for a character to be so narcissistic that they they think the book needs to be about them. Maybe I'm going to go with that. So I then just got up one day and I just decided to write his stream of consciousness just to see where it took me. And he then became actually quite essential to the plot because he is such a foil to Marjorie and Enid, her assistant, his, the assistant, um, and these two brilliant women. But he is on their trail. So he adds danger, and you need danger in an adventure story. Yeah, of course. I love how you describe that as almost you have to like become the characters and let them tell you where the stories go in. In a way, like that's is that kind of what it felt like for you? Or I, do, I think I mean I'm very I very much do believe in structure and in plotting if you can, but obvious. But my plotting normally really happens once I've written the book. That's the time I'm really good at writing the plot is when I've already written it and I can see what I'm doing. But uh, at the same time, I don't really believe in the letting the characters just, just do whatever they like because obviously if they just did whatever they like, I sometimes liken it to um, you wouldn't really leave your children to run the house for the weekend. <laughs> they're very small. You know, there, is, there is some control required. And, you know, and you've got to keep the reader with you and it mustn't be an indulgent piece of writing. You know, it's got to be going somewhere. So uh, even though I'm constantly surprised and I think surprise as a writer is really important. I also have my eye on just, you know, what this means, what the shape of this is. What am I trying yeah. to say? Yeah, that makes sense. We've had some questions actually about your sort of writing method and style. So um, Dawn's written, 
How do you organise yourself with so many ideas on the go? So do you write all ideas down in one place or do you have different notebooks on the go for each book and idea? Because I know you've got quite a few, haven't you? Mm -hmm. um, how do you avoid getting overwhelmed and achieving nothing? Because she says that's what she does. <laughs> well, just the last one, I do get overwhelmed frequently on a daily basis. So don't worry. That, that happens to all of us. Uh, and I do have... Because at the moment I do, unusually for me, I have actually got a number of different projects on the go. And it just means they each require a different notebook because otherwise I'd just be too confused. But then I have a notebook that is just like a general notebook. And then I have a notebook in my bag in case I think of something then. And then I seem to have notebooks. in. I have notebooks everywhere. I have post-it notes in my car. Not that I really go in my car anymore, but I did. And which if I had a passenger, I could just say to them, can you just write this down for me? And they would write it down. And so I think as a writer, because ideas come to you when you least expect them, and because life often surprises you and offers you a new way of kind of, you know, adding to your story, it's very important to have somewhere just to jot things down. Yeah. Do you ever find yourself, I know it's a classic is just, you know, you can't think of something all day and do you ever get into bed when you're trying to drift off to sleep and all of a sudden you just get hit by ideas or are you, did you, did you find it easy enough to switch off at night? I get into bed and that's it. Okay. <laughs> just, 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 yeah. But I am woken hideously early in the morning. I think it depends. I think as if you're a creative person and most of us are, uh, you need to know when you're most creative and I know I'm useless in the evening. But I'm, my mind is much sharper and more creative and kind of open uh, in the morning. So I can get open, I can get up very, very early to start working. And also I love dawn. I love that time of day. I find it really inspiring. Oh, you're, are you part of like the 5 a.m. club then? Or it's not quite that <laughs> no, I am. I mean, actually, it's been 4 a.m. recently, which is why I'm a bit ragged. Yeah. Yes. No, I've heard I've heard very good things. I think there might be something in that about getting up early because people do say they really get a lot done. <laughs> um, I've got well, I think, yes, I think if you're, uh, especially for those of us who have children, um, it's just like private time. I always think you know that the children are safe, but they're unconscious. So you know, it's kind of you just kind of you can relax, and it's almost you can find your own space. And I think as a as a woman, especially, you do need to allow yourself time where you are you can inhabit your own thoughts. Yeah. And it's I think there's a lovely quietness in the morning. It's like if you're about to get up to get an early flight and you drive and there's just nothing, it's so quiet. And I think that can be really nice and watching the sun rise and um yeah, it sounds really that's a good tip. It sounds really good. So maybe maybe that could be something for people to try if they're trying to kind of get on with a project maybe try getting up a little bit earlier when things are a bit quieter um because we've got another question about your writing so um lynette fisher says do you write as a full first draft and then redraft or are you tweak as you go so i think you kind of mentioned a bit about this um yeah so what's your you know was it common for you to ever get to the finish finish point and then redraft or is it just going tweaking as you go like Lynette says all the time yes I I tweak as I go I'm the person who should not give advice on how to write a first draft because I do all the things you're not supposed to do I know people say write 10,000 words a day and just get to the end and then you'll be fine but I'm much more careful and as well I I can't really progress unless I believe what I've written and uh in order to believe it, that means you've got to dig quite deep. So I can't really just fly and see where I go because that would mean that it's not, for me, it's not really properly developed. You know, it's not really, really thought through. So I do really, really rework things as I go and I abandon a lot. Um, I take a lot of wrong turnings and have to realize they're wrong turnings and cut them out and go back to where I was before. I think it just takes me a very, very long, it's a long process. And sadly, I can't gallop to the end in one go. Is that ever frustrating or how yeah. how do you find that? Because that must be so tough to sort of 
just yeah but especially if you're stuck on a section like even when i've been at uni of essays and stuff and i know what you mean it's sort of like can't move on until this bit's right but then it's sometimes you can be stuck like that for months or years even can't you yeah you can you can and i think that's the thing probably that um uh makes kind of writers that sort of you know that, that end up doing it professionally it's that obstinacy i think it's just tenacity really that you just won't give up it, it seems to be the area in life in which i absolutely will not give up and um okay. yeah so your passion isn't it that's the thing if you're passionate about it you get that kind of extra you know dig deep kind of to carry on and do you um because obviously you've got quite a few books so do you find that you flick between writing you know write a bit of one write a bit of the other or do you come back to books or do you work quite sort of methodically as in book by book and finish one before you start the next I have to yes I have to write methodically like that I mean I'm in a curious place at the moment where having finished one I've got about, I mean, probably about 10 ideas. Wow. Uh, the things I could do. So it means that in my head, I am dealing with 10 potential sets of characters, which is just incredibly crowded and quite noisy, you know, quite bothersome. Because I don't really know where I'm going. I mean, I've got a hunch of where I'm going, which one, but, but it's sort of like you've got all these possible characters and all these possible setups. So it's a, I do find it's quite, it's a lot to think about, but I'm just kind of seeing what yeah. sticks. So I've got to be patient. Can you get them out of your head? Do you, do you find like once you just have to get it down on paper or even when it's down on paper, they still sort of going around like <laughs> teasing you sort of with all these ideas. What's it, what's it like? Yeah, well, until you've actually written the whole thing, it, I think it does tease you. I think it's, it's a really good word for it. I think it haunts you, it itches you, it stings you, it hits you, you know, it does all those things, it kisses you. It's until it's finished, it's it's a constant. And I think that's another thing you just have to accept that you've always got a slightly vacant look, even when you're kind of talking to somebody about something else, because somewhere on your shoulder, yeah. your characters are there kind of still with you. And you must just be thinking there's so much potential, like just trying to put your finger on kind of, it must be so hard if you think this could be an amazing book. But yeah, I, I, it must be amazing to have all that company around you. <laughs> thinking of these people. Yeah, around you. yeah during lockdown, it's very handy. <laughs> so I've got um, a question from uh, Lorraine Mead. So she says, why did you choose New Caledonia as a setting for the expedition? Have you ever been there? Um, I have to say, in COVID times, it was a joy reading about a tropical island. I really agree with that. It's a bit of escapism, really, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm very glad now that I did. Obviously, when I was writing it, I had no idea about COVID or lockdown or, you know, and I didn't even know these words. Um, but the decision originally uh, came from... Uh, deciding at the beginning that it would be set in the UK because that's kind of where I'm comfortable, you know, that's what I know. And then I began to write it and I just thought, hang on, this is an adventure story. Um, so it's got to be an adventure, not just for these two women, but for the reader and for me. And uh, I felt I had to take away from myself all the props that I normally use in order to capture that energy that is an adventure story you know of the unknown mm. so I, I felt well it can't be here then I've done that um I've got to set it somewhere else so then I tried France and I started writing it set in France which I I know quite well um and then I just it was sort of every time I got the women standing outside a patisserie or something I just thought hang on a minute I've read this mm. I've read this before and if I've read this before, the reader's read this before. So this isn't an adventure. So then I thought, and anyway, I thought in 1950, it's difficult to, to get to France, but it's not impossible. So then I thought, okay, it has to be the other side of the world. It's got to be absolutely everything that these women don't know. It's got to be really hard to get to. It's got to be everything I don't know in order that I am with the women. I've got the same, uh, I think this, being in the unknown is the best way I can put it. So then I just had to do a load of research because obviously I've never been there and I couldn't get there at that time um, for lots of reasons. So out of all the places, why <coughs> Caledonia? 
Did you have lots of choices? Simply because it was the other side of the world. I'd never been there. I didn't know anyone else who'd ever been there. I couldn't find any literature set there. Yeah. So I felt this is this this is a kind of um as you, you know, as as you say, it's exotic, it's tropical, it's it's out of my experience. Yeah. Uh, so it's so clever as well to like spot that gap because I think you do just when you've read stuff you sort of naturally that's what you think like oh yeah I could set it in this but to actually really think yeah. outside the box like that and sort of like you say it's a, it's out of your comfort zone not only for the characters but for you I think mm. it can mm. be really hard to write out of your comfort zone so mm. yeah it's it's amazing. but I think it's very healthy and I think if you want to keep mm. learning and obviously we all do uh, you've got to keep pushing away what you rely on. Perfect. I'm going to quickly skip to, I'm going to come back to the other comments, but this one's just really made me chuckle. So you know how you said earlier about how you've got all the different characters um, kind of with you and sometimes you're looking a bit, you might look a bit vacant at someone. Someone's just put Lynette, um, there should be a t-shirt with it that says, yes, I look vacant. <laughs> there we are, collaboration right there. Um, Christina, uh, sorry, Christiana says, which authors have influenced your writing? Oh gosh, this is such a good question. And I'm really useless at this one because I go completely blank. But I would <laughs> say, um, as a writer, uh, I knew somebody, another writer once years and years ago who used to say to me, if you're writing, then just read books that you think are really terrible because then you won't be put off. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that's not true. And I think you should look go to writers that really inspire you, that you feel have something in their voice that, you know, sings to you in some way, even if you have no hope of being in that kind of space. So I set my sights very high. And um, I think I would always go to, I would look at Anne, always look at Anne Tyler, always go to Elizabeth Strout, um, well, Hardy, I think, is for me a very kind of a very good place to go and just look at how he's doing it. I mean, I think as a writer, you've got to really you don't just read you kind of savage books. You're just really trying to work out how they're put together, what the language, you know, the rhythms just you just kind of really trying to work out how it's done. Marilyn Robinson, she's another one. I really admire Marilyn Robinson. Uh, I mean, there are so many. So yeah, many. They, 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 Graham they, Green. Graham Green. I mean, well, like if you different genres and stuff, it can be really. It's like when someone says, "What's your favorite music?" and you're like, "Oh." But yeah, yeah. and this links a little bit on to um to what Dawn said as well. So, um, the last part of her question is, "Did you manage to um read for leisure?" So she said, D "Um, did lockdown make you more or less productive with your writing? And did you manage to do much reading for leisure?" Um, and that just made me think about what you were saying as well in terms of can you read for leisure or do you find as an author you're constantly reading with like a critical kind of eye on things? It, yes. I mean, I now always read with a pen in my hand and it's not because I'm marking it. It's because I'm just really want, you know, if anything strikes me as interesting or or gives me a thought about something, I just need to mark it up. So I really believe in marking up books like really, really getting involved in books. Um, in terms of lockdown, I found it really hard to begin with to write or to read. I think everything felt so unfamiliar um, that that was kind of, I was very caught up in, I think just the strangeness of the time. So I wasn't really, I think, and I think in order to really, be able to write and read you have to be allowed to escape <clears throat> pardon me and the beginning of lockdown strangely didn't feel like a time of escape it felt um i mean you know obviously it was lockdown but it didn't feel easy for my head to escape yeah it must be hard i think as well when you're trying to be like creative and there's just so much going on that's sort of yeah i think every, everyone said didn't they like working from yeah. home was so difficult but how was it for you like have have you usually worked at home? Did, was it a big change? Did you still notice, like, you know, maybe not going out to meetings and stuff as much? Was it a lot for you to adapt to or kind of being a writer and working for yourself? Did you find actually it was pretty much the same as usual? 
in that sense, it was pretty much the same as usual because I work at home and I work my own hours and I don't commute in, you know, I mean, everything was the same in that sense. Um, but my family were all back uh, for lockdown. So we were a kind of, we were a very big, noisy house um, of six <laughs> adults now, you know, and there were all the kind of tensions of, being a family back together, but also a family during lockdown. So, you know, and we're lucky we have a garden, you know, we, we, we kind of, we, we just had it so much easier than so many other people. But I was just, I found it very hard not to think about what was going on in the world generally. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And just fighting over desk space and Wi-Fi and all that stuff that comes with it <laughs> must be tough. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's, it's The world feels very heavy, I think. And I think it can be hard sometimes to be like, because your books, are, a lot of them are very like heartwarming and lighthearted. And maybe, I don't know, maybe it was a bit hard to be like lighthearted yeah. in those times. Yes, yeah. I think it is. It is. I mean, so, you know, some people obviously manage it, but it, it was hard for me to find that. Yeah. Mm. OK, so I'm going to come back in a second to a question on Howard Fry, because he is one of our friends. Um, but I'm going to skip to Julia's question for now. Um, so Julia said, Marjorie is such an interesting character and so different from Enid. Um, do you think that the best friendships are not always based on having lots in common? Are any of the characters based upon real people as well? Um, so I'm glad. Yes, I'm glad that you find her interesting. I mean, I, I'm very fond of Marjorie and I think Marjorie and Enid are basically an introvert and an extrovert. And they're probably uh, slightly extended, exaggerated parts of me. Uh, it, but I'm probably more Marjorie, sadly, than I am Enid, is the honest truth. But I think I recognised that I needed a bit more Enid in my life. Um, and I think that's why she kind of came along into my brain, wherever it is. Um, so best relationships based on having lots in common. Well, I think it depends how you define a best friendship. But I think the thing about these women, the reason that I began to love these two women was because I saw that they were capable of change. And they were capable of, even though somebody like Marjorie is very set in her ways, she came to a point where she realized that actually she was wrong about some things and that Enid had something to teach her. And that actually in order to really develop and to really become the kind of woman who could achieve what she wanted to achieve, she had to find the kind of Enid in herself. And similarly, Enid, I would say, who's on her own quest, um, needs to find the kind of Marjorie part of herself, the more just solid, rooted part of herself. So in terms of that friendship, I think it did, it, 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 it benefits from them being opposites. And I suppose it just depends whether you're prepared to go out of your comfortable place. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's sort of like you, one brings one down, one brings one up in certain yeah. sort of areas. Yeah. You know who it reminds me of a little bit? I don't know if you've seen this. Have you ever seen the film The Odd Couple? Hmm. I think I have years ago. Oh, yeah. oh my family yeah. loved that film. And that's, I mean, it's not obviously quite the same. It's two men, but it is, it's like these two men sort of put together and they're just total opposites. One's really like neurotic and likes everything a certain way. And one's just really chaotic. And, um, and it's a similar thing, but I think there's something really funny about watching or like reading about two just totally different people that you just think, my goodness, how are they even surviving with each other? Because this must be a nightmare. But I love how it then turns into such a lovely like outcome and it, like a lovely friendship. Um, but yeah, do you have sort of have you? Was there any inspiration from like real people, or was it just? Com I know you said that they're parts of yourself, um, mm -hmm. but in terms of like watching that sort of relationship, is is it anyone that's inspired you, or was this completely sort of fictional? I think Enid, I have no clue where she came from. I just don't know. I mean, apart from I think there was a need for her. I mean, I think as a writer, you do, it's important that you find the things you need to write. You might not understand why you need to write them, but that you, you know, you have a need, a compulsion to actually pursue them. But Marjorie was kind of based on um, when I was a child, my grandmother had uh 
well, they were called aunts. We thought that there's Auntie Edith, Auntie, you know, various aunts, but they weren't actually, you know, blood relation aunts. They were my grandmother's friends. And they were all women, now I look back, who were single, who must have lost um, their fathers or, you know, uncles, brothers, perhaps in the First World War, and then survived the First World War and then lost a further round of brothers, sweethearts, friends, fiancés, husbands, sons in the Second World War. And uh, not sons, sorry, if they if they're spinsters on the whole. Uh, but uh that those women who I think, even if they found work during the Second World War, as many did, were then expected to kind of just get back in their boxes at the end of the, you know, and just basically, I don't know, just sort of teach people like me when we were in you know in the in the 70s. Um but we're, we're pretty, I mean, I think pretty unacknowledged and, and given a pretty poor deal. And, and those women that taught me at school who were all in their 60s, I look back and think what incredibly brainy, brave, eccentric women a lot of them were. But we gave them such a hard time. I mean, I'm really ashamed that's, of how awful that's, we were. That's, that's kind of why sort of Marjorie gets up. And I think that's a... Yeah. That's a massive because she's a teacher and she's she sort of gets yeah. through all the time and it really made me think not that much has changed you know uh, my mum's a teacher but lots of people I know are teachers and it, it can be so tough so yeah, yeah it's, it's it's I think yeah credit where credit's due <laughs> if you're in that sort of profession <laughs> it can be tough so and um, there's some questions coming up about Harold Fry so before I ask these do you want to give us a little overview of Harold Fry because this is probably one of your uh, best known books isn't it would you say or it's definitely one that's very popular do you want to give us a little overview well I mean actually it's quite well I mean it's it's the story of a man who receives a letter out of the blue one day from a woman he hasn't seen for 20 years um, and used to work with saying that she wants to say goodbye because she's in a hospice in Barrick-upon-Tweed he lives in Kingsbridge so they're opposing ends of England really but yes yeah, she's she's dying of cancer and he um posts a kind of goes to post a really inept kind of reply because he doesn't know how to express what he feels he's completely uh kind of cut off from feeling and um just begins to realize that it's not enough to post a letter and that sometimes you have to do something and so decides completely in the moment without any planning, without any kind of thought that he is going to walk for her the length of England to her so long as she waits. So he will walk and she will live is the idea. And it's about that walk and how it transforms him and how it transforms other people that he meets Uh and it's also about, you know, why he is the man he is. It's also the story of his wife, who's waiting for him back at home, who uh, we see at the beginning of the book, they have a very cold relationship and they can't really even speak to one another. And she, like Harold makes a kind of physical journey to Berwick and she makes, and an emotional journey, but she makes another journey, which I now call a lockdown journey, because actually yeah. she goes home. And so they they both arrive at a different place. Oh, and it it is described as like so like life affirming and like heartwarming. Both your I mean it seems that that's quite a running theme, I think, with your books, is they're very like you read them and it's kind of like, oh, you know, oh could shed a happy tear there, sort of thing. <laughs> um so how this um christiana said so harold went on an adventure and your new book is obviously very focused around adventure so what is it about journey and adventure stories that you like well i mean i'm going to stop myself writing one next time i'm going to make my characters stay in the same place but i do love an adventure because i think structurally it, it's just, it's such a, it's the kind of classic for me, story, uh, telling, device, in that your characters leave what's familiar and they have to step out in the world. 
And in stepping out and away from what they know, they kind of open themselves up to change. So it is a kind of, it's metaphorically, it, it works as, a, as an arc of transformation, really, which is, I think, probably for me, what stories are generally in some, you know, about um, the kind of capacity for change. Definitely. And I think that as a reader as well, it can be so sometimes like we're just in the usual nine to five, same, predictable. So when you have an adventure, it is about like escapism, isn't it? And I think that's a big part of life. Like people always feel like feel alive when they don't necessarily know what's coming the next week or the next year. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a really nice thing to read about as well. Um, and so Stuart said... Um, he, he loves the unlikely pilgrimage of Hell Cry. Um, is it true that there is going to be a film? It is. <laughs> it is. Fingers crossed. We all have to cross our fingers. But yes, I've been I've been working on the screenplay for absolutely years. But it looks as if I mean it's possible that they'll it might be filmed next year. So that is so it's got some so more it's got to a place where it's looking more possible now. I've got these books in front of me, actually. So this is, if you haven't seen it, everyone, this is The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. I just love his little his little shoes. <laughs> there. They're so cute. And then this one links onto it, if I'm right, doesn't it? So you have the love song of um, Miss Queenie Hennessy. Yes. So this is the lady who he gets the letter from, isn't it? Yes. So it, yes. So that so the, the love song was Queenie Hennessy. I didn't really ever know I was going to write, because some people sometimes think that I intended to write both, but I really didn't. I just knew I was writing Harold. But then I did feel once I'd written Harold, because so much of it is based on my dad's story in some way, because he, I wrote it for him as he was dying of cancer, basically. Um, so uh, having talked a lot about my dad, when I was talking about Harold, it began to bother me that I only ever talked about him in terms of cancer when he was, you know, he was so many other things. And it really made me think about Queenie and think, well, she isn't just a woman at the end of the journey. She's actually, you know, she's led a very full life. She's led a very important life. And uh, I really suddenly realized that I wanted to, it's like in a moment in a, in a film, you know, where the camera just goes, you just get the opposite point of view. And it's, I think it can be really satisfying as a reader to see what's going on, you know, in the, on the other side. Yeah, um, and and I felt that if I, as so long as I didn't repeat anything from Harold Fry, so I wasn't allowed to be uh, to kind of dredge up old stuff. I had to keep finding new things, but within the context of what I'd already written. That must be quite nice in a way, because I bet there's probably so mm. much that you chose not to put in the book, or was there yes. anything you kind of? Yeah, well, I had the that. opportunity to look. You know, I think sometimes. Mm. You know, Harold's story, I was so involved in Harold's story, I couldn't really do Queenie's story because if I if I went to Queenie's point of view, I would have shot myself in the foot, so to speak, in terms of suspense. Because half the suspense is, will he get there? What's happened with yeah. Queenie? What is happening with Queenie? So it wasn't right to follow her story in Harold Fry, but it did feel right to give it space, you know, in another place. Yeah, and I just love it because, like I said, you've got his little shoes in this one, and then you've got her little shoes in that one. <laughs> I just think that's so sweet. Um, yeah, and then you can definitely tell they're in the same series because they've got the same sort of style. So um, if you've read if you've read this one, definitely have a look at this one as well. Um, you've got a couple of other questions. So Fiona says, um, "I love Harold and Queenie. They were they were my introduction to your books." Both were beautiful stories. Did you plan? Oh, did you plan to write the two books, or did Queenie's story grow from Harold? So that's you just answered that one, really, haven't you? But yeah, she, she yes. says she loves them and their introduction to your stories. Do you find that a lot? Do, do people often hear about you through them, or um, is there like another book that you feel that people kind of discover your work from? Well, I think over here, certainly in the UK, uh, and and actually overseas. I mean, Harold Fry is in about I think it's about thirty six languages or something. Wow! Like <laughs> so, so that is definitely the book that people have kind of you know found my writing through. Mm -hmm. But um, Miss Benson's Beetle is doing is in the New York Times bestseller list. I think it's yeah. the, the fourth week now, something like that. So it's. Um, I think some people haven't read me before, but will maybe go on to find Harold as a result of meeting Marjorie. So, 
it's quite, I mean, it's strange, isn't it, how it works, but I think it's yeah. all fine, whatever order, it doesn't matter. Well, this one's a lot more recent, isn't it? This one's only yeah. come out. So I think that, yeah. yeah, people that have known you before probably would have been from these ones. But um, I think definitely, like, if you if you like, if you like Howard Fry, you're going to love Miss Benson's Beetle. It's the same sort of, um, it's obviously a completely different story, but if if you enjoy like adventure and like, you know, sort of life affirming, heart lifting stories, I think it's going to be great, isn't it? Um, and Lorraine said, um, who would you like to play Harold and Queenie? Or is that too much of a controversial question? Uh, no, it's not a controversial question. I actually don't know the answer. I've been so involved in writing. You know, I was so involved in writing Harold originally. Um, and originally, first of all, he was a radio play. So I mean, it, that, that's how it all started. So he's had many different forms. And uh, he's always he's always just been this man in my head. I can't quite imagine who can play him. I don't really know how they're going to do it. I mean, I'm assuming they will. And I don't I don't know about Queenie either. I really don't know. It must be so strange because it's about how is it ever going to live up, live up to what is in your head? I think that's why actors feel such a pressure, don't they, to kind of do a character justice because they're sort of yeah, you know them best, but. I wonder, hopefully you'd get a say in part. Well, I hope, yes, I hope so, I hope so. Yeah. But I, think, I mean, the great thing, because I have been writing for radio for years and years, radio drama, and I do love writing radio drama because of that collaborative process and because you give actors the words and, uh, you know, you have these characters in your head and then an actor takes them on and they'll they'll kind of interpret them in a slightly different way. But I find that really... I mean, generally, I mean, there's a couple of times when it I haven't, but I mean, this is over 25 years. I find it really inspiring when you see what people do with with what you give them. Well, it's all about interpretation, isn't it? I think that's one of the probably the nice things about books. I mean, I know there's like the book film argument, but I, I suppose what lots of people say about books is that you get to imagine as the reader, like you could have lots of different versions of that story in your from different readers' perspectives of what people look like and stuff like that. So it's always a challenge, but oh, I think it's been a great film. So I'm really excited for that. Um, Stuart Chesterman says, is there going to be a follow-up to Miss Benson's Beetle? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I thought about it, but oh, I don't know. No, I don't. I, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe there'll be a different you know, another well you said you're going to avoid adventure for a little bit didn't you um, I think I have to yeah I think I have to because I think it is about challenging yourself and as I was saying earlier you know taking away the things that you rely on and I know that I do really love the quest the search the journey so uh, I wonder if I've got to go on a different kind of journey next time yeah so tell, tell us briefly about because you've got um i'm just thinking for christmas you've got uh the snow garden and other stories oh, yeah. you as well so that's like a collection of short stories instead do you want to give us a little overview to those yes i always forget to mention them they're like <laughs> i wasn't gonna let you forget around christmas no, i'm glad you haven't because actually i'm i'm quite proud of them they were they're a series of interlinked short stories, but they're set over the Christmas period. So there is one for the kind of last day of school, and then there's one for Christmas Eve, there's one for Christmas Day, there's one for Boxing Day, and so on and so on. And it goes right up to New Year's Day. Um, but they're all of them. It's, I mean, I love a short story when you have a character who's the main character in one, and then they've just got a tiny part in the next. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's sort of like the baton is passed on, but you don't know who's going to pass it on. Uh, so they, they kind of form a full circle in the end, which as a writer, I just found really kind of, you know, it's just sort of quite meaty and delicious. So it just means, even though they are short stories, it has the feeling for me of something a little bigger. And I do love the short story. I think it's such a hard thing to write. Um, but they are, I think, very similar to an afternoon play. It's the oh. same. I feel um, a, sort of a genre at all. Would you say like they're um, they're obviously they're quite heartwarming again and quite like witty as well, aren't they? Um, do you have? Did you want them just to be quite like nice Christmas reads, or is there any sort of elements to certain ones like adventure or crime or anything like that? There's never really very much crime. I'm not very good on crime. 
I mean, there's crime. I have to say, I mean, you know, there is crime. There's, I think, there is, you know, there's, there's abuse. There's that. You know, there's lots of you know, that, that's all going on. I mean, just generally in what I'm writing, I'm yeah. always looking at the shadow and, um, you know, the flaw and the wounds and why why we are the way the way we are. So that I think you know, that, that for me, that's all there. But in terms of the short stories, I. Uh, I kind of wanted to sort of look at people, you know, how they deal with this particular time in different ways. And they are, you know, I mean, the one is about a woman who's recently split up. So she's going to be doing it on her own this year with her children. She hasn't, you know, she just doesn't really feel like it. Another is about a couple on Christmas Eve who realize that they haven't actually assembled the bicycle that they're supposed to be giving their son the next day for Christmas. So they sat down, you know, at 10, 8 o'clock at night to start building this thing and then realize there were no instructions. So it's that, you know, it's kind of oh. preposterous. If that was based on some friends of mine who nearly fell out on Christmas Eve one year because they started to assemble something for their son. And yeah, and that's, I think a lot of people on. Very Another brilliant. one was I wanted to kind of do a sort of contemporary nativity type, you know, sort of story, but set it in an airport. So they're they're all kind of they come from their very different places. And yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I really love how, how um, when you have stories like that 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 fo focus on like almost real people's, they could be real people's lives. Um, yes. And I think yeah, Christmas those times that it's like it's so um what's the word it's such a big time for everyone and it could be for all different reasons so like it yeah. can be the hardest time of year for some people it can be the best time of year for some people and I think that that's that's really nice to kind of acknowledge like all those different viewpoints and sort of yeah I guess just be a bit more aware of like all the different things people might be going through on on like Christmas and well, it carries I mean for people who celebrate it obviously and not everybody does but it carries so much weight and so much expectation which of course means that it's ripe for, for you know tragedy and comedy which yeah. are areas that I like but I said I was just thinking that I kind of think of I suppose the snow garden is a bit like a sort of grown-up advent calendar in that you know there are stories for almost but not quite every day. I should have done 24 and that would have been really neat, but I don't. That could be the next one. <laughs> it could be the next one. <laughs> okay, and there's another Christmassy thing you've got, because what? tell us about what's happening on Christmas Day. Oh, yes, yes, I have. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, this year I was commissioned by um, BBC Radio 4 to write an afternoon play for them for Christmas Day. So, so that was um, recorded during lockdown, or was it? I think it was, or sort of lockdown, post lockdown, but still in lockdown circumstances. So, yeah. it's uh, it's a it's, it's a play about again about a couple who are um, you might think kind of gonna ha expected to settle down, um, but they're both. I mean, they they meet they meet in strange circumstances in that they're by a lake and he's trying to swim and she's just trying to make her shopping lists and they become they become more and more involved in one another. And it's just about how you might celebrate Christmas in a different way, but with family not wanting you to. Oh, I love it. Cause you've, you've got a bit of a history in sort of like um, plays and acting as well, which I didn't actually know straight away. So oh, is it yeah. nice for you to get back to doing sort of stuff that's not just being read, but almost being performed? Yeah, I know I love it because as I said earlier, I love working with actors. Um, and I love, I think radio drama is such a special uh, medium that we have. And we're very, I mean, there aren't many nations, countries that, that have it. Um, but we have this kind of brilliant platform, I mean, every day where a new piece of writing is dramatized. And I think it's, it's done on virtually no money uh, and uh yeah I and mean, with kind of, it really takes risks they can be really good they cannot you know they cannot work but uh opportunities for new writers i feel it's a really important um medium that we really have to look after yeah and it's it's great to give that um 
I, like one of the biggest things that we hear is people saying, God, I really want to read, but I just don't get time to read. And I think that that's a really nice kind of step into reading um, or, you know, a nice compromise. If you're someone that really wants to learn about, you know, get, kind of get a bit more cultured, learn about different authors and different stories and have a bit of escapism but you know maybe you're a busy mum or you've got a really hectic job and it's something that you can listen to on your commute or mm -hmm. as you bath or as you're doing the washing up or something like that so I think that it's nice to have options isn't it so you can yeah. sit book one day but then other months where you're really busy you might prefer to listen to something a bit like a play or an audio book and things like yeah. that so, um I think, I think what, what, yes what a, what I love about a play is that you're just plunged kind of right in the room with the characters and yeah. you, know, you have to work out what's going on. And so much for me in radio drama, in, in drama is about subtext and what doesn't get said. So it, I think, you know, it's, it's really rewarding to listen to, to just kind of go on, you know, to just kind of be working with that, but, but being right in the middle of it and nobody explaining it to you. Yeah. Wow, you have been so busy. I don't know how you've been so productive throughout this whole year. Um, you must be so proud of everything. Have you got anything else that you wanted to add? Or has anyone got anything else in the comments that they want to ask before we go? I feel like lots of people have been saying, you know, oh, Christmas list. So there, if you want to see the Christmas books, we have got a whole selection. Um, and the one thing I didn't mention as well is the, um, the music shop. As well, that's one I've not mentioned, but that's been another really popular one, hasn't it? So, um, yeah, did you want to give a really quick overview of that one as well? Oh, gosh, I don't want to. I mean, I mustn't keep people from their evenings, but that is just <laughs> about a man. I mean, it's about celebrating a shop. So, it, but in this case, it's a record shop, a man who is passionate about vinyl and seems to have a talent for finding people the music that they need is kind of the... In a, in a nutshell but that one has been I'm actually writing the screenplay for that as well oh wow okay so that yes amazing yeah. great um well yeah I think unless anyone's got any other questions everyone's just saying so Christiana says um thank you so much for answering their questions oh. and um L Lorraine Mead as well thank you for a really lovely presentation it has been so lovely having you thank you so much for taking the time to have a chat with us. Um, like I say, you've got so much for us to look forward to. So who knows, maybe next time that we, if we chat again next time, we might have a film, we might have more more books. So have you got anything in the pipeline or are you kind of settling down for a bit now? Well, I, no, I think I've probably got to just finish the these, these kind of, these notebooks of mine that are a bit, you know, with the various projects. Everything's got to be signed off, I think, before I am. Um, really commit to a new book because I know I really want to write a new book but I know I have to just do a few other things because then I'll I, when I do start it I will get lost is your classic Christmas present are you like a paper chase notebook person is people always I buy a new notebook, really love a notebook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well there we are then for everyone else and then Christmas list for you new notebooks <laughs> perfect well thank you so much Rachel um for everyone watching, I'm going to put all uh, Rachel's social media tags because you're on Instagram and Facebook. Is that right? Yes, I am. I'm used. I can't. I mean, I'm useless on. I don't do Twitter. I just feel like I, you know, it's better for the world if I just keep quiet <laughs> and better that I just listen. But I do. OK, I do try to do Instagram. OK, well, I can put your tag up because then people can have a little look more. Um, and yes, in fact, the one good thing about I'm managing to do at the moment is various actor friends are reading um, excerpts from Miss Benson's Beatles. So you can go back and see. Um, it starts with one by Juliet Stevenson doing the voiceover, but then Neve Cusack does one. Um, uh, Hermione Gulliford does one. My husband, Paul Benevels, does one. Various, various people. And there are a few really lovely ones coming as well. Oh, that's amazing to have even more little tasters so people can get a flavour for the book. Oh, perfect. Well, yeah, I'll put all the links down. Um, and this video, you know, it's been live today, but feel free to keep sharing it with everyone you know because you can watch it back. We're not going to delete it. Um, and hopefully when things settle down a little bit after Christmas, we're going to kind of look to make a YouTube channel um, where we can sort of start putting all the videos to watch back. Um, so, yeah, share yeah. the video, everyone. Um, you know, any any comments you have, feel free to keep commenting. It'll be lovely to hear what you thought. 
Um, we've got them all in the book nook at the moment. So, you know, order with us. Um, you can order with us in store. You can drop us um, a message on social media. You can send us an email, all the usual ways. Um, and I'll put that in the in the post in the comment section so you can be reminded if you're not quite sure of how to get in touch with us. Um, but these would make amazing Christmas presents. And we're doing gift boxes as well. So if you want to kind of round it up and have a nice a nice book, with some little treats on the side, all packaged up lovely in gift wrapping, then easy. We've saved your Christmas. <laughs> last minute all right well thank you so much rachel um it's and hopefully so we'll have you yeah soon maybe when finally we can do face-to-face -face things or something so. oh i can't wait i can't wait for that i really miss i mean i'm quite a quiet person but i really miss meeting readers it's yeah. been one thing i've really really missed yeah hopefully next year <laughs> hopefully <laughs> All right. Well, good night, everyone. Have a lovely evening and we'll see you soon. We're open. So please come say hello. It's been lovely having our customers back in store and actually getting to have a chat with you and recommend some books. So, yeah, thank you again so much, Rachel. Have a good night. You too. Bye. Bye.